I had this really interesting conversation with a guy. This is a few years ago now. I was actually in researching my previous book, but it was an idea that that carried through to this book. And I was asking him about the human need for for feedback and rewards and games and you know, like why do we do all why do we play games on our phones and all of that? And he was he was saying to me that having unpredictability in our lives, not knowing whether we're going to win something, is really rewarding to humans. And he was telling me the story that. A friend of his, he wouldn't tell me the name of the friend, but he said, my friend is a very, very big time Hollywood actor. And when he goes out, he'll go out on the town, he'll have, you know, go out with some friends, have a, a meal or whatever. And this was particularly true apparently when he was dating. He would go out and it was just trivially easy for him to meet people, to have conversations with people, and then to to go out on dates with people. If he approached a, a girl, she would say yes. And that was, it was obvious that that was the case. He basically had won the dating game. It's unpredictable for most people, but for him, it was absolutely predictable. And he, he was so deflated by that, this actor. He used to tell his friends like, I know you guys will never understand this because it seems like the dream, but let me just tell you that winning every time, as absurd as it sounds, is the most deflating experience. Really interesting things happen when you don't know that you're gonna win every time. Hello, hello, everyone. I'm Larry Weeks, and this is The Bounce Podcast. Today, we're going to look at the challenges of creative blocks, inertia, and the accompanying feeling of being stuck, whether it be a project, product, or your personal life. And more importantly, when we find ourselves in these states, how do we get unstuck? What is the step-by-step structure of a breakthrough? My guest is Adam Alter. Adam is a professor of marketing at the New York University Stern School of Business and the Robert Stansky Teaching Excellence Faculty Fellow with an affiliated appointment in the New York University Psychology Department. Adam is the New York Times bestselling author of two books, probably now three, Irresistible, Drunk Tank Pink, and his latest, which is also the topic of the podcast, Anatomy of a Breakthrough, How to Get Unstuck When It Matters Most. Adam has also written for the New York Times, The New Yorker, Washington Post, Atlantic, Wired, Slate, Huffington Post, Popular Science, and many other publications. And his research focuses on judgment, decision-making, and social psychology, with a particular interest in the surprising effects of subtle cues in the environment on human cognition and behavior. His research has been published widely in academic journals and featured in dozens of TV, radio, and print outlets around the world. In fact, he's also part of the curriculum of Section 4, I believe it is. This is Scott Galloway's educational arm uh, of his company. So on this podcast, we talk about being stuck, the commonality of creative blocks and why progress isn't always a straight line, and how our reactions to being stuck might be uh, the real problem, and Adam addresses that. We talk about the process of getting unstuck and how that process can lead to valuable advancements. In other words, there's some benefit to being stuck. Why the creative process is is often lengthy, messy, and contrary to many people's expectations. So we get into the problem with expectations as it involves creativity and, and being stuck. And then we talk about why breakthroughs often seem accidental and come after uh, hitting a wall. Adam goes into the fact that this can be a skill set that you can learn, breakthroughs, that is, getting unstuck. And we talk about whether breakthroughs happen more commonly in groups versus just individually. And I get into remote work versus offices, being with somebody proximity, how that affects our stuckness or breakthroughs. And we talk about whether uh, creativity declines over time or not. And then we get into some of the tactics that Adam has in his book uh, regarding breakthroughs, including uh, the friction audit, which I found very interesting. And then we talk about the role of environment in creativity and progress. I ask him about the use of AI, uh, since we're all playing with these uh, various types of tools. And then we discuss when someone should quit versus persist. And, you know, when you're hitting a wall and there's much more to it. So please give this a listen. If you're not stuck now, you certainly have and will be again. So I would give this a listen for some proactive help, uh, that's for sure. Or you may know somebody who's stuck. So Adam gives some great advice here. So without further ado, here's Adam. Thank you so much for for coming on the show, Adam. Thanks for doing it. I, I appreciate it. I'm very excited to talk to you because uh, one of my favorite books has been Drunk Tank Pink. 
you talk about environment and how it mm-hmm. shapes our thoughts and feelings, right? Drunk tank, paint, yeah, the jail. But there's a, a passage there that I have in my notes. There was some study that's suggesting that high density living mm-hmm. uh, hampers generosity, and other researchers have shown that overcrowding similarly provokes mental illness, drug addiction, alcoholism, family disorganization, and a general diminished quality of life. So I want to talk about remote work real quick. I wanted to get your opinion. That's an extreme example, the the high density, but there's some areas, some cities, I've been in the offices. I mean, these are high density areas. And now working for Google, these they were the coolest offices you can imagine. But I'm just curious as your opinion because of that, what you think about remote work, what we might be losing, and how to do it. In other words, if we return to work, how, sh- how should we do that? I kind of miss the office. Three days a week, I've, hi- you know, I've, I'm paying for a place just to go when I don't need to, but just to go, be around other people. And I have a good friend of mine. We're doing it together because we collaborate. And it's been helpful. You know, I'm done after the third day, you know, but I like going to a place. I get a different mindset, if that makes sense. Yeah, I mean, there are a lot of different reasons why people bristle at the idea of remote work and why leaders and managers bristle. So one of the concerns is there's no, they feel that they don't have oversight over workers. So when there's a hierarchy, that's one of the concerns, right? So that's, you get a big bank, there are thousands of employees. It, there's a concern that people are just kind of doing their own thing and not really working properly. But if you're self-motivated and driven, you don't need to be in an office. There's, I, unless, unless your work requires that you're around other people explicitly for collaboration purposes, you don't need to be in an office. So as long as you can overcome that motivational hurdle, which by the way is a big hurdle for a lot of people, I don't see any reason why you should be in an office. And I think it's always worth thinking about what the, what the kind of default is. So when you're asking humans to produce their best ideas and to be mo- as productive as they can possibly be, does it make sense to surround them with hundreds of other people? Probably not except for cost reasons, efficiency reasons, and some other reasons that really have nothing to do with the quality of the work. So if you can preserve all the good features of being in an office, and I'll get to that in a second, because you mentioned going to a place, then I don't think you need you need to be in an office as long as you can sort of retain a lot of the best features at home. Now, what does that mean? For a lot of us, for a lot of the time, when we are trying to produce good ideas or when we're trying to work or we're trying to get out of our home mode and go to our work mode, having a different place and and indeed having a commute between those that your home and that place is important because as humans, we are very sensitive to location and context. So a lot of people can only really switch on their work brains when they're not at home. And so asking people to suddenly just treat home as both a home and a workplace is a lot. It's asking them to do a lot of mental work that ends up putting quite a lot of load on their on their system. And so that's that's one of the concerns. And so what the ideal is, I think what the ideal is for me and for a lot of creatives and people who do this kind of work is essentially to have your house, to have a one minute walk to your office that happens to be adjacent to your house and then to go to your office. So for a lot of people, that means having like a shed in the backyard where they've put a computer and maybe a fridge I think that's the ideal, unless you need to be in meetings collaborating with people. And I was thinking in terms of breakthroughs, because in terms of, is it easier or harder to have a breakthrough by yourself versus groups? And would a shared space where people gather, is that more conducive to breakthroughs, brainstorming, for example? than a Zoom meeting where you get... So so first, the question of alone versus with others. Some of my best thinking I do with other people because I think out loud. I talk through something. I'm hearing my ideas and go, oh, that sounds stupid now that I say it, but I'm saying it because there's someone else there. So that, that was my other question around breakthroughs. I didn't mean to jump into breakthroughs right the second because I want to talk about how we get stuck. But since we're on the topic of group dynamics, remote work, what have you. The the idea of brainstorming is that you build on the ideas of other people and they build on your ideas. And so what the end product becomes is, is greater than the sum of its parts. But I think before you get to brainstorming and before you get to creative processes in the pro in the presence of other people, or where you collaborate, it's okay if they're in the room, but if you're all thinking separately, that's really what you need. 
So you always begin. I think in any creative process, you need to begin as, a, as an island, as a single individual. Because what ends up happening is, let's say there are 10 people involved in a brainstorm, and I've been involved in so many of these in different contexts, uh, advertising firms, consulting for all sorts of different businesses and watching this process unfold, is if you have 10 people who go off on their own and they think and they formulate ideas and then they come together, you have 10 independent sources of information that you can then combine in hopefully fruitful ways. But if you start with a brainstorm and you have one loud person or one person who's particularly vocal or particularly communicative, or there's a hierarchy or all sorts of other things are in place, you reduce those 10 independent sources of ideas to sort of a single dominant idea. And then everyone's running down that path. And it's very, very hard to right the ship, to come back to what would be, I guess, a stable equilibrium if you don't end up liking the the path that you take. Whereas when you have 10 people with 10 separate processes going on, those inputs can then independently be combined and and you're much more nimble and flexible when you do that. So all all of the research suggests brainstorming has has a place. In other words, thinking as a group has a place, but it should never happen in place of or before you've thought about whatever the issue is alone. So it's very important that people think as individuals. Well, I've never never heard that. That's interesting. You can't just have brainstorming or group work on its own. It's almost always a bad idea to do that. And and if you think about it, it makes logical sense. It's not even sort of a, a big kind of explosion. Here's what I would prescribe if I were doing this. So obviously you might have some people who are more junior and you have some people who are more senior and the junior people are naturally going to be more quiet, right? So even in a brain, whether it's they're doing things individually or in a brainstorming context, their ideas will generally be drowned out. And so I think what's really useful is to ask everyone not necessarily to publicly share their ideas, but to come in with a sheet of paper that has five ideas on it. It can be bullet points. It doesn't have to be shared with the group, but at least that way you've been forced to formulate your own individual ideas before you even come to the process of either taking the lead of the loudest person in the room or the most senior person in the room or doing whatever it is you're going to do. You have five times, say, 10 ideas, Mm -hmm. 50 ideas among all those people. That's a great place to begin, much better than starting from scratch in a brainstorming session. Yeah, and it it happens sort of informally or I want to say obliquely in a sense, like product management, like there's a doc that the product manager makes and then everybody comments on. So it, it kind of happens that way, right? Where people are reading, you know, the general idea and what we're trying to build and then they're commenting so that in a way that's that, but it's, I've never seen it formally set up that way. We're okay. We're soliciting ideas, but guys think separately before we come to the meeting, then bring them to me. Does it matter then from a proximity standpoint? Do you know if there's any studies, whether in-person brainstorming sessions versus some assuming if everybody's remote, these are Zoom meetings. I, 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 I did some consulting for a company out of the UK for a while, and we would have these mastermind sessions and there was that aspect of here's the problem. Everybody was bringing their own challenges in, and they put it in a doc. And then if you had time, you looked at it before the meeting, but then we would have, you know, a Zoom meeting or, or what have you and talk about it. I mean, those were really, really good. And we were all over the world, right? So, but I always wonder, do we miss something being in the same room together? Yeah. I mean, I think the things you miss on Zoom that you that you have when you're in the same room are mostly, again, things that we all over the last few years spending a lot of time on Zoom recognize. There's an organic back and forth, especially when it's more than two people or, you know, like when we talk back and forth here, it's not that different from from being in the same room. But if you put 12 people in little boxes on screens, that's going to change the dynamic and the flow and the fluidity of the communication process. And so I think being on Zoom is more problematic the larger the group, first of all, it's more problematic the more you require a fluency and fluidity among the members because what it, it ends up being, if you think of it as sort of serial versus parallel communication, when you're all in the same room, you're very sensitive to what everyone else is doing. Lots of things can be going on at the same time. You Especially can if somebody's left out, you, that, that's more yeah. obvious. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think you just have to be much more sensitive on Zoom to the dynamic. And so you, you've got to think about what is more complicated about being on Zoom? You don't really, there's a kind of delay and it's it's harder to work out what different people are thinking and doing. Whereas if you're in the same room, you know exactly what's going on. I often talk to my students about this. I had to teach for two years online for obvious reasons. And I'm back in the classroom now and have been for some time. 
And people always say, what's it like teaching on Zoom? Why is it so much harder? And I think part of why it's so much harder and why meetings on Zoom are harder is because if I look over here, if I look to my right, you have no idea what I'm looking at. And if I'm not staring at the screen the entire time, as far as you're concerned, I'm disengaged. But if we were in the same room, it's a 3D space and I can look to my side, I can look to the other side, I can I can look down for a little while. I don't have to keep kind of it's fatiguing. Zooming in. It's fatiguing. It's, it's fatiguing. And also, also there's the sense that I've lost you on Zoom in a way that's not true in the room. As long as you're still in the room with me physically, I know that you're here. But if I don't know what else is going on outside of this little box that I'm looking at on Zoom. So there are a lot of sort of question marks socially about what might be going on. And I think all of that can harm the idea generation and collaboration process in ways that being in person does not. Yeah. So there, there are a whole lot of sort of subtle, nonverbal issues that come up, I think, in addition to the communicative ones when you're on Zoom. Okay, let's jump into the the main issues here. I want to talk about getting stuck and mm-hmm. how to get unstuck, right? So the concept of getting stuck, it seems like when reading your book and, and hearing you discuss this, having blocks or getting stuck is not really a problem per se because creative blocks are common, for example, and progress is kind of a jagged line. It's n- never straight, even though the direction right. may be up or, 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 or down. It's, it fluctuates, oscillates. But it sounds like the issue with getting stuck is our response to being stuck. I- is that the problem? Yeah, I think that's, that's a really nice way of summarizing one of the core ideas of the book, which is that we instinctively are not well-designed to respond to being stuck to that experience. If we're physically stuck, we're very good at dealing with that. So the human body is well designed to deal with physical entrapment. If I pin you under a heavy object that's not you know, crushingly heavy, but it's fairly heavy, you will mobilize all sorts of fight flight responses, your adrenaline will pump and you'll develop what is often described as hysterical strength and you will get free. But unfortunately we confuse that physical stuckness and emotional stuckness or cognitive stuckness, mental stuckness. And so if I'm trying to be creative or I'm trying to work my way around a problem that's that's intellectual or that's emotional or something like that, I'm going to flail in the same way that tends to be very useful in the physical context. And that flailing is very unhelpful in the context of, of getting mentally unstuck. That's, I think, the biggest problem. So if you can train yourself to see the next instance of stuckness, which by the way is inevitable, as you've said, it will happen as just part of the process. Here are my, this is what I do. Here's my five-step process. This is the first thing I do. This is the second thing. And you don't treat it like some big alarm, some siren is going off and that this is at the end of the world. You are like 50% of the way to getting clear. It's to be expected. Exactly. Okay. You should anticipate it. So is part of the benefit here bringing stuck or getting stuck, bringing that into one's awareness. What I mean by that is, I wonder how it manifests itself, but we're not aware that it's stuck. If being stuck is not on my radar, I could mislabel it as something else when really I've just hit a part of this creative process that I need to address. Does that make sense? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think usually when you're when you're really stuck, you know, you you it's pretty clear that you're stuck. I think what happens though is there's a sort of gray area around that where you're like either you're fighting it or you're suggesting that it might not be happening or you're trying to convince Yeah, if I turn I, I'm wondering if apathy is one manifestation could be a manifestation of yeah. of being stuck. In other words, I hit a wall and I just give up because I don't know my way around it, so uh, you know, it, it's a form of resignation when really you're stuck, but there's something you can do about it. Yeah. I mean, I think the way I got into this research in the first place was I, I did some research looking at how people across the world anticipate change and understand change. And I found that people in the West, people in the US, Canada, the UK, Australia, New Zealand tend to be blindsided by change and by stuckness as a result of that. So we think that things as they are now will just continue to be that way. And when they shift, we're a little bit surprised by it not at a high intellectual level, like we know on some level that everything's going to change. You know, there's a sense that things do change over time. But when it happens to us, it feels like this kind of very strange, confronting personal experience. In the East, Japan, China, Korea, not at all the case. The people in those countries in general, culturally speaking, say, oh no, of course, everything's about to change. It could change any second. 
you know, we're bouncing constantly from night to day and summer to winter and everything changes and my life is no different. And so I anticipate that something's going to change any minute. Impermanence. Now, and they, they, impermanence is built into their. Yeah. Yeah. They're ready for it. And as a result, they recognize that things are shifting quicker than people in the West do. And therefore they're better prepared for the stuckness that ensue, ensues when anything that you've been doing doesn't work anymore because the situation has changed. So I think that's, if you can train yourself to anticipate change and to be on the lookout for stuckness as a result, I think you are quicker to, to work your way through it. You've noticed that there is this cultural difference in... Yeah. I'll tell you how we do it. So one of the ways we do it is we give them stock charts. So financial stocks, you show them patterns in financial stocks, or you give them weather reports. You say, this is what's happened the last five days. And so you might show them five days of sunshine or five days of rain or five days of snow or a stock chart that shows the stock's been going really very well or very poorly the last few days. And you say, tell me what's going to happen tomorrow. And in the West, we think that whatever's been happening, the trend will just continue. We don't say that, oh, it's oh, any minute now it's going to change. You know, you see five days of sunshine, you say, oh, we're in a sunny period. Maybe it's a drought. I don't know. And if it's rainy, you say the same thing. We're in the middle of a wet spell. And if the stocks are doing badly or well, we just think that's the period we're in. But in the East, you give that same set of charts or the same weather reports and same weather data to, to people in the East, and they say, oh, no, I mean, that's crazy that it's been going on that long. Surely it's about to change. So they're looking. They're like, where is the change? I'm sure it's around the corner. That's a very different mindset to approach the world with. And actually, the Eastern way is the right way because that's actually the way the world works. There's much more change than we anticipate in the West. Oh, that is fascinating. Why is that a Western mindset? So I think what a lot of it rests on is, is, is a sort of sense of dominion over the world, a sense of control over the world. There's a, a writer named Bruce Feiler who wrote a book called Life is in the Transitions. And I talked to him about exactly that question. And he's thought about it a lot. And my ideas are overlap substantially with his. And one of the things he's told me is that this sense that things won't change, that we are able to direct our lives in ways that allow us to push off external change comes in large part from the sense that science, medicine, technology have allowed us to control certain aspects of the world that were once uncontrollable. And when you pair that with moving away in general from religion towards a more sort of secular way of living, religion basically says to us, anything can happen anytime and you just, who knows, you know, you're kind of at the mercy of some superior being. But science says, no, you're the superior being. You have dominion over the world. You decide how the world should be. And scientific and technological tools allow you to do that. And as we become more and more sophisticated, that illusion grows stronger. But of course, it's an illusion. All you need is 2020, March 2020, the whole world shuts down out of our control. And so that's a huge colossal change that affects the whole world, all 8 billion of us or 7 billion at the time. That, I think, surprised people in the West more than it did people in the East who were like, yeah, it's just another big change that we have to face and we have to figure out. What I'm picking up here is if we don't expect to be stuck, it's going to be a bigger problem when it happens. So I have a quote here from your book where you say, you know, the richest adventures come from getting stuck and then unstuck over and over from learning what works and what doesn't from persevering in the face of difficult lessons. So if we can look at being stuck from a benefit standpoint or as an opportunity as part of the creative process, we'll be in a better mindset. And don't let me put words in your mouth, but we'll be in a better mindset to then get unstuck. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I, I had this really interesting conversation with a guy. This is a few years ago now. I was actually in researching my previous book, but it was an idea that that carried through to this book. and. I was asking him about the human need for for feedback and rewards and games and you know like why do we do all why do we play games on our phones and all of that and he was he was saying to me that having unpredictability in our lives not knowing whether we're going to win something is really rewarding to humans and he was telling me the story that a friend of his he wouldn't tell me the name of the friend but he said my friend is a very very big time hollywood actor and when he goes out he'll go out on the town he'll have you know, go out with some friends, have a, a meal or whatever. And this was particularly true, apparently, when he was dating. He would go out and it was just trivially easy for him to meet people, to have conversations with people, and then to to go out on dates with people. If he approached a, a girl, she would say yes. And that was, it was obvious that that was the case. He basically had won the dating game. 
it's unpredictable for most people, but for him, it was absolutely predictable. And he, he was so deflated by that, this actor. He used to tell his friends, like, I know you guys will never understand this because it seems like the dream, but let me just tell you that winning every time, as absurd as it sounds, is the most deflating experience. Really interesting things happen when you don't know that you're going to win every time. And Think so about the this, movies that you watch. Yeah, you none know. of them have someone who wins from minute one and wins all the way through minute 120, and you sit there and say, well, that was a really great film. It has to be filled with complexity and obstacle and hurdle and friction. Otherwise, it's not interesting. And, I, and that, we don't think that's true of our own lives. You're like, you want to watch a complex movie, but then go back to your easy life. But if your life is really that easy, it turns out to be deflating. There's kind of not, there's no richness. And so meaning comes in large part, I think, from, from that struggle. Have you read the book, um, Art and Fear? No. David Bales. Um, they, there's an experiment where an art teacher informed half the class that their grades would be based on the sheer volume of work. And then the other half of the class would be the quality of what they determined would, would be their best piece, right? And unexpectedly or expectedly, I, you know, it depends on how going into this, what, you know, what your opinion was. The students who focused on the large amount of uh, flawed work outperformed in quality those aiming for perfection. So mm -hmm. this process of embracing multiple Im imperfect creations proved to be way more beneficial than, right. than striving for this single masterpiece. So there's something that's illustrating for me on, on the creative process that it is kind of messy and it is kind of unexpected. And if you approach it from being perfect or, or not failing, you have the opposite outcome. Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's right. There's a lot of work written on this idea that quality and quantity go hand in hand, and in particular, quantity leads quality. So th that exact idea that you just described, that tons of output, even if it's low quality or it seems like it's low quality, is, is a predictor of quality in the end. And one of my favorite anecdotes from the book that I came across as I was researching the book was Jeff Tweedy, the front man of the band Wilco, the rock band Wilco, but also himself a writer, so he's a sort of creative renaissance man, talks about exactly that. He's like, some days I wake up, I've been a creative for decades, and it's some days I wake up and I just don't want to be creative. I don't have it in me. I'm exhausted. It's just not going to happen. So he talks about this idea that you need the quantity there for the quality to flow. So what does he do to, to ramp up quality? He lowers his expectations basically all the way down to the floor. And he says to himself, if, I, if it's music, say he's writing music that day, he'll say, let me write five of the worst musical phrases possible on purpose. And because the, the bar is so low, even if he doesn't feel like doing it, he just like cranks out some nonsense. And he's so good at the job of writing music that he, he manages to do this. Some of them are actually not bad, turns out. Some of the bad ideas themselves are not bad. But even the fact that he's cranked out five bad ideas basically means that he knows better with the sixth idea what he doesn't want to do. And there's some value in that, the contrast effect. But also he's kind of lubricated the, the, the engine that's required to be creative at all. And so then good ideas do follow. And so I think a lot of what happens when you're liberated to create quantity is that maybe what comes out first is not great. He even Tweety talks about pouring out the bad ideas first, like they're sitting like a level of scum above the pond. You pour out the bad and then the good clear water is below it. And so that first... Quantity is a predictor of quality because those first few ideas are bad, but it's the, the sixth to 10th ideas that are actually good. There's a lot of evidence for that in the literature, in other areas as well, um, in creativity research showing exactly that. So we're stuck. Let's say people listening, they're, they're stuck in some aspect of their lives. By the way, can we apply your principles to any type of stuckness, whether it be just a personal problem or product-oriented, project-oriented? Could, yeah, the, the concrete okay. prescriptions vary, I think. You know, like if it's a creativity context, that's different from being stuck in a relationship that you want to leave or stuck in a job you don't want. But a lot of the same ideas hold. And so the, the broad general abstract process holds for all of them. So let's talk about how we can understand breakthroughs and how we can have a breakthrough, which sounds weird to me. And I've always thought of breakthroughs more emergent properties, you know, or more accidental than something you can just you know, or skill set, really. Although I could connect the dots on the skill set that I, 
I think I have or I see in my life where, you know, I've uh, I've had breakthroughs or, or what have you. But still, I, I don't think I've when I reflect on on breakthroughs, yes, brainstorming, you know, things that were on purpose. But the whole point of this book, I think, but you please tell me is that, yes, you know, you, you can apply models or frameworks and actually cause it to happen. Yeah. So th- broadly speaking, there, there are two lenses or ways of thinking about breakthroughs. And this is particularly for creative breakthroughs, but it's for breakthroughs in other areas too, that one is called the insight lens. And this is the idea that you look through a lens and you, some people just have more insight than other people when they look through that lens or they, that's the sort of way of thinking of creativity that it's about this insight just kind of landing on you, some great insight, some eureka effect. And that does happen. That does happen in creativity and other domains. It's a little interesting, but it's not interesting in terms of what you can do with it. It's sort of a more mystical thing and it's a little more abstract. And it actually describes a a relatively small part of what it is to be creative and to hit breakthroughs. The other lens is the production lens, which is what I focus on much more and what what I think is more useful and what is more algorithmic and has a process to it. And that's the idea that actually it turns out a lot of breakthroughs are just mechanical. You just have to know the right way to to build a machine. And then once you let the machine run itself, you end up moving in the direction or converging on breakthroughs, on outcomes that are valuable and and, uh, that help you move forward. And so that's what the book is about. It's about the importance of using this production lens and the importance of recognizing that as with, I think a lot of the best science is about taking processes that seem mystical, you know, that ancients used to say, oh yeah, that's just like, there's a God that makes that the sun go around the earth or whatever, or when they thought the sun went around the earth. That's because they didn't understand it. But as soon as we understand it, there's a mechanical process to it. And I think that's, there are still some concepts like breakthroughs, insight, creativity, eureka effects, originality, all of that is 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 kind of still hidden to us to an extent. This book is an attempt to do what science did for the movement of the planets, for example, which is to say, I know that sounds very highfalutin, but it's just saying it's actually not that mystical when you boil it down. And let me try to boil it down for you. So the book lays out that framework. What would be a good example that we could hang clothes on here, Adam, of being stuck and then finding a breakthrough? Because I'm using general terms like projects or a product, or maybe is that the best way to talk about it? As we... it's, up to you. it's up to you. It okay. often depends on the audience and what the audience is most interested in. But I have been running a survey for several years now, asking thousands of people around the world for their examples of being stuck. And they vary dramatically. Some people are trying to learn how to play an instrument. Some people are trying to be artists. Some people are stuck in a relationship they don't like. Some people are stuck in a workplace they don't like or in a career they don't like. Some people are stuck financially. Some can't lose weight. Some can't put on weight. Some can't get more fit when they want to run faster. Some are stuck in athletic pursuits. It's incredibly broad. I find, I I agree with you that often it's useful to think of a concrete instance. It just sort of depends on the direction of the conversation. But I don't know if if you're thinking create, create. Yeah, I'm trying to think of, I'm trying to think of something in my life that I'm okay with sharing. Um, (laughs) (laughs) I got one for you. A friend of mine, we were at a dinner party and we just came up with an idea for, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if this movie was about this? And it's a screenplay that we wrote, but we... It was written for like a Netflix series. So we wrote a couple of, of the episodes and we submitted it in a in a contest and what we won first place for this for this screenplay. And everybody's like, you gotta you gotta go with this. But we we don't have an ending. <laughs> we we don't have a the the main arc of where this thing is going. We're kind of stuck. Mm-hmm. There you go. So we're like we've got like episodes, you know, like 10 episodes figured out, but we we're kind of stuck as to where this is going to go. Is that bad? Is that a bad example? No, not necessarily. Right. I can tell you what the process is. Not every aspect of the process will apply to every situation, perhaps. We can certainly use that as an example. And often that's what you find. It's a process where, in this case, you're engaged in a creative process that has been successful, and then you hit a wall, and you're like, I don't know what to do next. And you find this all the go. time. Yeah, artists have this, filmmakers have this, producers have this, I mean, people in every imaginable domain where they're trying to be creative have this moment where they say, I've written myself into a corner, or I don't know what to do next. There are lots of different options or which notes come next in this or which chords or which, you know, how do I, how do I make the music sing? What we haven't done is sort of unpack the basic framework. And there are three limits to the framework. And the framework has, they all start with an H. Each one gets three chapters in the book. 
And the first one is heart. And it's the idea that your emotional response needs to be appropriate given the suckness that you're facing. And so in the case of what you were describing earlier, you said, what about a, a fun spirit or a playful spirit? Is there value there? And the answer is absolutely. That's a huge part of the emotional response to stuckness. If you can say, hey, I'm stuck, but this is really fun. I'm engaged in this. I had this great conversation. Um, my The first hmm. event for the book, the launch event, was a conversation um, with Malcolm Gladwell. And he talked about his father and said his father was a mathematician. And he spent 30 years working on a single math problem. And he was stuck. But he loved every minute of it. That's not being stuck, really, in a sense because he was engaged in the process. He didn't have an answer, but he never at any moment really felt like he was mired in place and that this was a hard process and it was arduous and how am I gonna go forward in life? He was in, he loved every minute of it. He was kind of in a flow state despite not having the solution. Mm. So if you are enjoying what you're doing and you treat it the right way and you treat it as a fun exercise, as a challenge rather than as a threat, that's so much of the battle is won there because then it almost doesn't matter whether you hit the outcome today or tomorrow or the next day or in Malcolm Gladwell's dad's case in 30 years. So that's heart. The second thing is head. What do you do intellectually? How do you intellectually solve the problem? There are a whole lot of things you need to do. You need to simplify the problem. One thing is to stop trying to search for radical originality, which is really important in creative domains. We're always looking for something radically new, but a much better way to go forward and not to get stuck is to say, I'm going to take 10 existing ideas and figure out the best way to combine them all, which is known as recombination. And almost everything in truth is a recombination of other ideas. So as long as you're okay with that, you stop looking for something that is genuinely radically new, you move from that insight lens to the production lens, and it becomes a much more mechanical process. And it's a very, very valuable way to move forward. And then the last step is actually doing the action phase, also called habit. What do you actually do to get unstuck now that you've had the emotional and the mental stuff dealt with? Let's actually do. Obviously, getting unstuck is largely about action. Um, and so there are, there are all sorts of things you, you need to do action-wise to, to move forward. And I, I talk about a lot of them in the book. Just a couple examples of the action-wise. Mm -hmm. Or you know, and if there's an 80-20 or if there's a, a macro-micro is just some ideas on the action side. Brainstorming, would that fall in the, that bucket? When, you, when we talk yeah. about action. Okay. Yeah, to, to an extent it would. One of the big things in, in that, that action bucket, I think brainstorming for me is more in the sort of cognitive bucket. It's thinking. Okay. It is doing. Yeah, so that makes sense. Um, but, but in the action bucket, it's, for example, one of the things that a lot of people do is they think like children. So the thing about children that makes them learn so quickly is they're unbelievably curious about everything. They ask a million questions, but adults lose that. So most adults stop asking questions. Their knowledge crystallizes, they have a certain set of things they are good at, and they stay good at that for the rest of their lives, and they never really branch out much from that. They're comfortable. They're a little bit narrow in what they do. Kids are just like, everything's interesting. To become more like that later on in life when you're an adult is very valuable. More, and that's more curious. As, more ask, curious, ask yeah. Ask yourself. Yeah, yeah it's known, known broadly as experimentalism. It's this philosophy of experimenting, of testing things. And what it involves is basically questioning a lot of things that you might take for granted. Let's go back to your example of writing a screenplay. You don't know how to finish the screenplay. One thing to do is to say, what are my kind of dominant assumptions about how you normally finish a screenplay? Like what, what if my default was going to be that the thing that I usually do, what would that be? Like, how do I finish a screenplay usually? It could be about process. It could be about the content that you usually write there. Like maybe you try to resolve the screenplay in a particular way. Experimentalism says, okay, I have a default. It's my sort of basic assumption. Now I need to create two or three or four or five other options, and then I need to test them all and see which one works best. I'm not going to assume that my default assumption is the best, which is what most people do most of the time. I'm going to be like a child, a kid, who says, why? Like, why would you do that? I have a five-year-old and a seven-year-old. Everything is why. They don't assume anything to be immutable and to be the truth until they've got a really good, like 10 level deep explanation for it. And that kind of experimentalism makes you really nimble and if you're stuck in the face of trying to finish a screenplay or finish a painting or finish a piece of music or whatever it is, it's a really useful way of moving forward because it gets you to consider the options much more deeply than you would otherwise. So we're, we're back to that volume over necessarily quality, right? Getting yeah, a lot of yeah. ideas, a lot of options. So, so yeah. that's, that's the first step. That's known as exploration. So that experimental phase is exploration, but then you've got to exploit. So these are two processes that are in opposition. This goes back to how humans dealt with 
say, hunting and gathering many, many generations ago when we were roaming the proverbial or real savannah and we were looking for berries and for animals to eat and so on. And you had two options, broadly speaking. Exploration is is going wide and broad, but not very deeply. It's sort of when you say, I don't even know where to begin. I'm just going to try a little bit of everything. And a lot of people do this, especially creatives at the beginning of their careers. They're like, I don't know what my style is yet. If you look at painters, Jackson Pollock's a really famous example. He became very famous for his drip technique, you know, throwing paint at the canvas technique. But before he did that, he tried five or six other techniques. He was doing what I just described. He was experimenting. So exploration, that process of saying, I don't know what's going to work best is the first step, but you can't do that forever because you'll never get to the point where you are known for being the drip paint guy. And so eventually you've got to zoom in on the thing that you're good at. And so what you do is you switch from exploration to exploitation. So going back to the savannah, what that means is saying, hey, I've noticed a lot of the animals or the berries or whatever are over in this general area. I'm going to stop focusing on all this other stuff and just put all my attention on this thing. And that's Jackson Pollock saying, hey, I've just found something that seems kind of interesting. I want to make my life now for the next few years about this new technique and being the best at at this technique in the world and no one else is going to do it quite like me. I'm going to say no to everything else and I'm just going to be myopic and narrowly focused on this thing. That's the next stage. You can't always be entertaining five or six ideas. And we all know people like that who never get anywhere because they're always in exploration phase. They never get to exploitation. But you need exploration to train your attention on the right area. And then once you do that, you start exploiting, that's when the good stuff comes. And there's a lot of research on different careers showing that the best periods in most people's careers tend to follow a period first of exploration, then exploitation. You mentioned, and I wrote it down, to kind of approach it like children do from a standpoint of being curious. Mm -hmm. I I think that's what you said. And then you mentioned briefly asking questions or, or the right questions. Are there any Great questions you recommend uh, when somebody's going through this process, they can ask themselves. Yeah. So what you're essentially trying to do, you know, there's this idea that's very popular, doesn't apply all the time, but it applies under certain situations known as the wisdom of crowds, which is just the idea that if you get lots of opinions, you can sort of average them and you get a better overall opinion from that average than you would from any one randomly chosen individual. And it's a powerful idea because it suggests that when we're unsure of something and our, our errors are kind of randomly distributed and we don't, we're not particularly good at understanding how we're departing from the true point of what we should be aiming for, it's good to have a lot of people because we kind of cancel out the biases we have and our errors and so on. But you can do this with yourself as well. You can turn yourself into an internal wisdom of crowds. And so the way I, I often think about that is you ask yourself first, what is your default? So if you had to make your best guess right now about whatever it is that we're talking about, it it could be a creative thing, but it doesn't have to be. What would that look like? And then the second question is, imagine you're wrong. Let's play devil's advocate for a minute. What's the, the next best thing? Assuming that that first idea is wrong, what's the next best thing? And then you're a third person, you put on your third hat, and the third hat says, all right, so you've got your your intuition, You've got your devil's advocate position, which is assuming that first position is wrong. Now play play the judge and decide which one makes the most sense and perhaps meet somewhere in the middle. Which bits can you take from each of those poles, those positions, to arrive at a response that seems like it's most useful and and most valuable? So so this is great. Let me make sure I get it. What is your default? Is that the the first answer or is that the position you're at now? Okay. Your intuition. Yeah, or I think. Okay. Or it could be where you are now. That's This fine is my too. default. This is where I am, or this is what I'm thinking this is. And then the second one is the devil's advocate position. Let's imagine you're wrong about that. Imagine you're, you're wrong, wrong, right? Mm-hmm. How are you wrong, essentially? You're, say, you're saying, that imagine you're to, wrong, and then, and then you get to second position. What's the next best thing? I guess I don't understand that question. What's the next best thing? What do you? Well, be- it doesn't have to be next best. It's, it's sort of a, a better way to think of it is, if I'm wrong, what's the alternative? You know, let's assume that's no longer an option. What's the next thing that I look to? Or what's my second my second intuition once my first intuition has been cast aside? Like if someone came and said, I see that you have that idea, it's wrong. Now what do you do? You come up with whatever's whatever's left, whatever the next thing is that you're going to train your attention on. And so you then have these two ideas, one of which you've said is 
at least for these p- purposes of the second idea, this one's wrong. Now you have two ideas and you have to mediate between them and decide whether there are bits that are useful within each and how to how to average them. And that's what the third version of you is doing. It's sort of the judge that comes in over the top and says, these two little people have come up with ideas, version one and version two of me, but version three is the kind of boss, the adult in the room who says, okay, you've had your fun. Let's figure out mm, which, yeah, I like which this. bits to take from that. I like yeah. this framework. It's uh, kind of like De Bono's thinking hats. He he has this process where you you put on different hats and you right. take different positions. I, I, I like that. Where does the friction audit fall in this whole framework of breakthroughs? Yeah, so a friction audit, broadly speaking, a friction audit is a process of finding where stuckness either is or is likely to appear and sanding down that stuckness and making sure that you've done a good job of it. So it's a very sort of general approach that I've used mainly in consulting with large companies or with startups or with charities or with government organizations. The big idea with the friction audit is that essentially in in trying to engage people, whether you're a charity or whether you're a company trying to sell a product, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. You have two ways to do that, to do that more effectively than you're doing right now. One way is to sweeten the deal. So you're making it, say you're dangling a carrot in front of people, you make the carrot look bigger and juicier. That's really expensive, especially in a competitive marketplace. So if I'm a charity and I'm going to spend a lot of money making my charity seem more appealing, there's a lot of competition. It's hard to do that. Trying to engage people when they're engaged in other things is just generally a a tough business. The return on the investment is low. The other thing you can do, though, is you can assume that there are certain reasons why some people are not getting through the process of, say, donating to your charity or buying your product. And that's a good place to begin. That's low-hanging fruit. And what that means is assuming that there are certain points along the journey that they're having with you or your company or your organization where they, they're they experiencing friction. Maybe it's that your website's not ideally designed or that your process requires that they have too many interactions with you or they have to get on the phone or they have to Too text, much paperwork up front. Something. Doesn't matter what it is. Yeah. And the best thing you can do is not spend all the money making the carrot look juicier. It's just to say there are too many sticks along the way that are preventing them from doing the thing I want them to do. Let's remove some of those sticks. Let's spend a little bit of money sanding things down, making it as smooth as possible. And often if your catchment is big enough in the beginning, and you can get everyone through that pipeline as smoothly as possible, you'll find significant return on investment. And so that's what the friction audit process originally was, but it applies just as much to life. You know, think of an area of your life right now where you feel stuck. Specifically, when you break it down, what is it that you're stuck in? Where is the friction? Is it how you communicate with a significant other? Is it about some aspect of your job that you don't like? You know, we often say, I... I don't like this thing. We're very good at being abstract about it, but we're not very good at being precise. And so the friction order for- forces you to think a little bit more precisely about the components of the process, whatever it is, or the the issue that aren't working for you. And then you start to think about interventions. How are you going to sand that down? How are you going to make it less friction filled? And that's broadly speaking what the process is. And how does it apply to breakthroughs? It can apply in all all sorts of different ways. I mean, part of what happens when you reach a breakthrough is there's a process. You've described, for example, brainstorming or sitting down with friends at a cafe and discussing a screenplay or whatever. Everyone has their own process. There will be bottlenecks in any process. It could be the way you all communicate. There are some really fantastic papers written in the academic literature looking at, for example, how bands, when they spend time together, when the members of the band spend time together, how do they write music? And when these these sort of anthropological processes of breaking down the interactions happen, you can see, for example, hey, the drummer, whenever the drummer says something to the singer, everything just kind of gets stuck. Like they, every time they have a conversation, they move away from the good stuff and they end up in the weeds and it's just not a good dynamic. We've got to fix that. Or, you know, when we're all sitting together having a conversation, we we very quickly just, there's one guy or one woman always seems to lead the conversation. We always run down that path and we never seem to get back to the central place where we're considering ideas fresh. So you've got to figure out where where these kind of friction points are that lead you astray in whatever process you have. And then try try some different things, experiment, try a different approach. Maybe have a different person speak first. Maybe do, do things individually first. You all go away for an hour and then you come back together and discuss what you found and make sure you've got some stuff in writing, that sort of thing. So you're just trying different things to so, different interventions. Let's imagine there are a thousand creatives out there in the world who are doing similar work to you. 
you know, if you put together every single creative technique those 1,000 people had and you created a compendium of all of them and said to each of those 1,000 people, you've tried some of these, some of these you haven't, there will be an ideal technique or set of techniques for you. You just don't know yet because you haven't tried them. And so that there's a very critical process. That's why experimentalism is so important because, you know, there's theoretically an infinite array of different ways of doing all sorts of things in the world that most of us haven't tried. We've tried very few of them. We've sort of plucked a few ideas from this very large menu. The more of those you sample, the better. That's why you should institutionalize this process of sampling. I wrote a note down here. I'm very intrigued about doing a friction audit when it comes to communication. If somebody that you're communicating with and it always goes sideways, I could see the value of a friction audit. But how the hell would you do that? Because it's actual the process of communication that you're trying to review, do a friction audit. I love the idea, but I'm like, how would you do that? What you've got to do is you've got to figure out where you can tweak things, where you have multiple options. So let's say you have across the course of a year, five important conversations with the same person that you've historically had trouble communicating with. The thing to do before you begin that first of the five is to say, okay, I have this history of having kind of rocky conversations. Maybe we get mired in some minutia, small issues that we shouldn't be spending our time on. Maybe we just end up in conflict, whatever it is. And so you should anticipate that's going to continue happening as you move forward unless something changes. So what do you do is you say to yourself, I'm going to have these five conversations. I don't know which technique is going to be the best friction reducing technique, but I've got some ideas. And so this might require some research or it might require intuition, but you basically list down, here are five things I could do. I could go in with a particular mindset. For example, I might go in saying, I'm going to assume that everything this person says is designed to be helpful even though the, the way they communicate, the way he or she communicates tends to be a little bit abrasive. So maybe one of those communication periods, you go in assuming best intentions. Another one, you might go in saying, normally I like to lead the conversation. For this one, I'm going to let them that person lead everything. And it might be a little awkward at first because it's a change in dynamic, but maybe that's the unlocker. Maybe in communicating with this person, I always need to let that person go first, and then we can both go back and forth. That's great. Very helpful. Okay. Let's talk about AI. I just had a podcast with Pedro Domingos. We talked about the big picture issues, work, jobs, humanity, you know, this this from a technological change and in, in innovation standpoint, what's you know, the and the and the pace of change. But I'm thinking about because I, I I built an application and it's it's for content creators, and I put in AI augmentation or I, I called it AI assist. And it's basically it's for writers. When you get stuck, it will, you know, and it's very good at this. You can seed it with content and it will run from there, right? And not all the output is good by any means, but there are kernels of sentences or ideas that I haven't thought of or yet. It's like, yeah, no, no. And then it could be one line, one sentence like, oh, well, okay. I knew that just hadn't thought of it, right? It just, it just brings it up. So in a way, uh, in specific task, I could see how it can break like a writer's block or, or, or a creative block, right? But I'm talking about, you know, augmentation. This is still me. I just need a little help, you know, through the stuck points. What's your view of, of AI right now and, and some of these tools and how it applies to breakthroughs? I think that's one of its best use cases at the moment is as a tool for, for getting unstuck and for making breakthroughs. And I think almost everything we've talked about today could be done with the aid of an AI generative engine. So for example, that process we, we described where you say to yourself, what's my intuition? Let's assume I'm wrong. Now, what's what are the best elements of each? You could do that with the help of an AI engine. Like you could go to ChatGPT and say, here's my intuition about this. Tell me how I might be wrong. And then it'll spit out something and say, here's here are some theories that suggest that you're wrong and here are some alternatives. And then you could say, now that we've got both of these out there, which which bits do you think are the most beneficial from both? Now, it may not be right, but it'll give you some, some food for thought. That's true. I think about writing, as you say, about being creative, that's the best example. So for example, I might be writing a new book and I'm trying to write the beginning paragraph of a new chapter. And I know what the chapter is broadly about. I could go to the model and say, I'm writing a chapter about X. Here's roughly what I want to say. Could you write the first three sentences for me? And of course, you don't want to use those sentences. They may not even be very good, but they will be like a conversation partner that has a huge diverse array of inputs. 
they'll be useful because they say, here is somewhere to begin. They give you the anchor and then you can deviate from the anchor a small way or a lot or a big way if you need to. But it's really useful to have that, that kind of conversation partner that's throwing ideas, lobbing ideas at you. I think it's a great use case for AI. Yeah, because I was thinking back to our analogy of didn't mean to, to to beat this to death, but the ceramics, you know, the multiple messy. AI is great at the multiple messy, you know, mm. put out the volume. Ah, somewhere in there, it's going to be a nice mug or vase, maybe one or two, but that's all you need, right? But you have to get you have to get through the 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 multiple the, and the messy. Adam, what have I not asked you? I'm going to treat you like. Yeah, you know, Jennifer. <laughs> so what what have I not asked you that I probably should have? I think the only thing I would say is it's very important to know who to ask. We've talked a lot about teams and brainstorming and who you speak who you, the fact that you speak to other people about your ideas and share them. But one of the big questions is who should you be sharing your ideas with and who should you create a brain trust around? You know, if you have friends or people you turn to for advice, who should those people be and how should you decide how to compose that set of people or voices that you turn to? A lot of the research says there are three kinds of people you should turn to in these situations. The predominant voice should be a voice that's a bit like yours. It kind of amplifies your your ideas. It's a bit of a cheerleader, maybe. These might be friends, family members, very useful. Well, they they get people. where you're coming from. They get you. Yeah. They get you. That's very valuable. And when you're putting together a team, you'll see organizations, big and small, do this. Everyone has a sort of broad cultural background that they understand at the workplace, you know, there might be like the five principles listed on the wall at the at the office that says, here are the things we do. This is what our company goes by. And everyone plays by that, that kind of general playbook. That's fine. You need those people, but there are two other kinds of people you need. One kind is, is known as a non-redundant input. This is an old term from networking theory. And the basic idea is that you want people who are, their, their circle of experience is different from yours. It's not in opposition, it's just different. So what that means is maybe you have different expertise. Maybe you did a different degree in university. Maybe you grew up in a different part of the world or a different part of the country. Maybe you have a different culture or religion or ethnicity or gender. It doesn't really matter, but you want difference. And you see this all the time. When I was a grad student and actually now as a professor, I see this all the time. When recruiters come to campus, they don't say, I'm from a big consulting firm. I'm looking for all the students studying consulting. I'll go down the list from the best student to the 10th student. They'll go to the math department and the chemistry department and the finance department. And they'll, they'll go to each of these areas and say, give me your best student. They're trying to find people who have different backgrounds. And you need that non-redundancy to maximize the solidity of the answers you get from that team. And then the third kind of response and Pixar is very good at this. A lot of their best films that they've created have done this. You bring in a black sheep that is in opposition to everyone else. Not in a rude way. They don't need to be abrasive, but their ideas are different. They're actively different. So what you do, for example, Pixar is known for its incredible animations. They spent a huge amount of energy and time perfecting, for example, the look of hair and the look of the animations of water and fur on monsters and things like that. All of that's great, but if you don't have a good story, you're, you're, you're gonna sink. And so what they do is they'll have all these animators who are working on the animations, and then they'll bring in a storytelling expert who says, what are you all doing? Who cares if the water is 99% the way there versus 100% the way there? No one's gonna watch this film unless we perfect the story. So you're all focusing on the wrong stuff. And so you need someone to push back. So you need those three kinds of people, the cheerleaders, the non-redundants, and the black sheep. Awesome. Thank you for coming on. Thank you for coming on thanks, the show. This was thank, great. Thanks Very for having helpful. me, Larry. Tell uh, my audience and me the, the best ways to find you, contact you, or obviously your books are everywhere books are sold. But um, if people want to you know, follow you, Twitter, where are you on the socials, that type of thing? Yeah, three places. Um, I'm on Twitter. You can find me pretty easily there. I'm on in, uh, LinkedIn is the, the place that I primarily post these days. Uh, and I have a website, adamalterauthor.com. So www.adamalterauthor.com. Again, you can search Google for me or that'll pop up and you'll be able to find whatever I'm doing at the moment. And, and that has information about all my books. Yeah. All right. Thanks again. Thanks, Thanks Larry. Appreciate it. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Well, that's a wrap. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed it, do share it with your friends and on your social platforms. Big thanks to Sam Williams, my audio guy. And the beautiful bumper music you're hearing is Michael Petrovich's Bella Luna. 
For all my show notes or resource links, visit LarryWeeks.com, and we will talk again soon. 